Hey, everybody. As you may know, One Hit Thunder is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network. And I'm not only excited to tell you about, but I'm also excited to listen myself to the new show, Countdown to Dallas. On the 60th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, former White House correspondent Paul Brandis takes an in-depth look at the seemingly unconnected events that led to that infamous afternoon in Dallas, Texas. He explores the troubled and broken life of Kennedy's killer, Lee Harvey Oswald, and challenges six decades worth of conspiracy theories, none of which have been proven. Paul combs through tens of thousands of documents, all recently released by the National Archives and Records Administration, the CIA, and the FBI. Paul's findings take us back to 1939 to explore the transient childhood and often violent teenage years of Oswald, a man who was focused on becoming famous by any means. The first few episodes of this podcast are out now, so subscribe to Countdown to Dallas today in your favorite listening app or at evergreenpodcast.com. This week, we're taking flight with the Scottish band Pilot and their timeless hit, Magic. Together with our guest, Kai Dodson, we get right to the point. Does selling out and changing the lyrics to your hit to Hawk Pharmaceuticals change the legacy of a song? We also dive into Pilot's musical journey that intersected with an impressive array of legendary musicians and bands. Stay tuned to see if we think the sun should continue to shine on the creators of this pop gem, or if we think the magic is gone after we've heard the Ozempic commercial one too many times. What's up, Kai? You're finally on One Hit Thunder. I can't believe it's taken this long. I am so excited. Yeah. Genuinely, I, I know I told you, Matt, but seriously, one of my favorite podcasts. I, I listened to it as soon as there's a new episode. I cannot wait. I'm very excited about this. That's You're awesome. the last guest before episode 200, so that's pretty exciting, too, actually. Wow. <laughs> Made it just under the wire. Yeah. Just under the wire. You brought a little <laughs> bit of a heater, too, and a song that has had a huge resurgence, which I'm just going to start by talking about this. Oh, 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 Zampic. <laughs> you guys, you guys, it's so funny. <laughs> it's here's it's so funny. Ridiculous. Here's the craziest thing, though, Chris. Did you notice that, like, when I think of this song, I think this song's been in so many movies and TV shows and commercials. The Wikipedia page for this song is like barren. Mm. Like, it's like two lines about the meaning of the song. There's no tab about uses in media. I don't know if the band is just like, we don't like publicizing well, the stuff that this song was used in or what, but it, well, I thought that was so weird that there's nothing on that page. Well, what else? There's it, one. I don't know what else it's been used in. Oh, I mean, I have a list here. It appeared in such movies as Happy Gilmore, Herbie Fully Loaded, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and The Incredible Burt Wonderstone, as well as TV shows like Ugly Betty, Extras, and Las Vegas. Okay. And Selena Gomez did a cover of it for the Wizards of Waverly Place. Yes, she too. did. That and was also on my pre- list. It's pretty rad. <laughs> really? Um, I always remember it from Happy Gilmore because I watched Happy Gilmore a fuck ton as a kid. And it's like a transitional scene. Like, it's not like it's like it's it's similar to um, the Exile song that we also need to cover one day on this podcast of I Want to Kiss You All Over. Like, it's literally a song that's used to connect like one scene to the next scene. <laughs> well, the Ozempic thing. It's like yeah. nonstop. Okay. Yes. Like yeah. <laughs> I have a Hulu subscription that has the commercial still. So it's nonstop. Oh, like so many times I'm like, oh my God, I, I can't believe this. I don't even know what Ozempic is. I had to look it up. It's a weekly injection that helps lower blood sugar by helping the pancreas make more insulin. And what I think is crazy about these <laughs> drug commercials is first of all, 
you don't just go to the store and be like, I'll take some Ozempic, please. You, your doctor has to prescribe the medicine. And then the commercial, 90% of it is just the side effects every single yep. time. <laughs> yeah. Who are these commercials for? I don't really understand it. I'm sure this conversation has been had by a lot of people, but is it a commercial targeted to drug reps? I, I don't get it. Nope. I'll tell you exactly who that commercial is targeted to. It is targeted to the large number of hypochondriacs that exist in this world that go to their doctor and demand that they get put <laughs> on a specific drug because they heard about it from somewhere else. Be just being friends with people who work in doctor's offices, you will be amazed apparently at how many people come in with the drug they want to be prescribed already in mind because they've been told by the internet or television that that will solve all of their medical issues. Okay. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> that does make sense. So you say people are, people are waltzing into the doctor's office going, oh, 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 Zampic. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. Then it they, worked. <laughs> they hear the first O oh, and they already know and start I, writing the script. <laughs> I want to posit a question to, to both of you. I don't know where I stand on this, okay? You had a hit at some point. For in pilots, when we're talking about pilot, we're talking about close to forty years ago. Uh, yeah. Do you do this major sellout move and take the drug money? I so here was something I was just debating this second. What is the what is the copyright rule if it's a parody of the song? Uh. That's interesting. I think they still have to get clearance, right? Okay, From they the still writers. have to. Okay, I'm just thinking about that because I remember there was the big Beastie Boys controversy shortly after MCA died that like one of the things in his will was that the Beastie Boys songs would never be utilized for commercial, is it, like commercials or whatever. And like sh literally like a year later, some random ad came out that was a parody of the song Girls. Right. And... The Beastie Boys had to sue them because they're like, hey, no, like we have it explicitly said that our music is not for commercial use. But I also assume that there was an issue of them not running it past the Beastie Boys before they record it, filmed and released a commercial that was a two minute parody of probably the song they hate the most in their yeah. entire discography. <laughs> right. And it goes back to you, which you guys have covered before, but about the Glee thing, about yeah. the Glee covers and the artists not having a whole lot of say in that. So maybe they don't have much say. Also, the strange thing about Pilot, who controls the song? Because two of the members are no longer are are pa had passed away. One of them earlier this year. Who, so which, I'm wondering, like who? One of the founding guys is gone, and then yeah. I think the dr the bassist. I want to say is the, the other one who died. The bassist, who he was the main guy, and then also the uh, the. I want to say the guitar player, I think. Yeah, the lead so, guitar player slash multi-instrumentalist, but so, not the other founding member. So David yeah. Payton died, the guy who wrote the no, song? No, David Payton's alive. He's Billy alive. Billy Lyle okay. is the one who yeah. died. Because I'm pretty sure in the Ozempic commercial, it is David Payton. I, I mean, <laughs> and I'll tell you this. He hasn't been shy about doing parodies, even back when the song first came out. I was watching an interview with him, and I guess he did a parody for each radio station in the UK that was playing them, a version of the song that they could use uh, to promote the radio station where they he like said the name of the radio station in the song. And, you know, he's never been shy about doing that. So... I'm pretty sure that this was a conscious right. choice. And that's why I'm asking the question. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not in a financial position in life where if someone came to me and said, hey, we want to use a punchline song in a <laughs> in a commercial for some yeah, random we want, to, we want to use Can I Get a Break for our Kit Kat commercial. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> I, well, but Kit Kat's a little bit little bit different because yeah because you're not giving into pharma essentially yes you're not, not giving in yeah <laughs> the question is big pharma it would be the same thing of like something that could be viewed as bad now i don't know i'm not saying ozempic for all i know it's a great drug that helps people but in general yeah. there's a yeah, heart transplant for a blood pressure medicine or yeah something. it feels <laughs> sketchy that's a great question i think i would have to wait until i was put in that position because my instinct is no absolutely not but then like you said, if Pfizer comes along and right. is going to offer me 
a million dollars, I would <laughs> probably say absolutely. Yeah, yeah I mean, it. it's hard to turn it. You, know, I guess if you're a if you're Taylor Swift, you don't need the money. But if yeah. you're somebody who had a hit forty years ago and you, you're getting moderate royalty checks and they can't really live on and you could be comfortable because of this one choice. But on the other hand too, for me, I don't know, man, it kind of ruins the song. I think, yeah. I think, Oh, 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 Zempic before I think, Oh, 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 it's magic. I really do now at this point. <laughs> so that makes sense. It's, it's an interesting question. I don't know. I would probably lean towards taking the money, but that's only because of my, you know, my band having no hits and also uh, <laughs> my Same. my personal financial position. So I guess it just depends. I don't know what kind of royalties. This song, to me, seems to have never gone away, but I don't know what that no. means financially for David Payton. So... I don't know about you guys. When I was doing research on this band, the biggest thing that jumped out to me is like, well, first of all, I guess we need to clarify. This is definitely a U.S. one hit wonder. They've had mm -hmm. a yeah. couple minor hits in the U.K. that would keep them out of contention if we, you know, it was three Brits on this podcast talking about the band. But um, the amount of like brushes with bigger, more successful acts throughout their career was crazy. The band started after Dave and Billy were in the Bay City Rollers as like replacement players, which like that alone is like, that's crazy. Cause that's like a, I think they might be a band that we could do on this show. I don't think anything's big. I don't think they have anything beyond that Saturday night song. Um, and then like they formed this band and then their guitarist and drummer go on to play on Kate Bush's first two albums. Right. <laughs> they like, are produced by Alan Parsons, which leads to them all joining the Alan Parsons project, which led to a very confusing thing where I had pilot radio on and the song Serious came on by Alan Parsons project, which is like every sports team's like yeah. running out onto the court <laughs> yeah. music. And I was like, holy shit, Pilot wrote this. You said that. You said, check out Alan Parsons' project, Sirius. Spelled S-I-R-I-U-S, not Sirius. Like the radio. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> and I had, I was like, I didn't know what that song was. And the second it started, I'm like, oh, yeah, of course this song. <laughs> the song that every high school football team highlight reel is set to. But then also when, when the band broke up. Like the band breaks up, the drummer joins 10CC, which was never like a huge band, but like I fucking love 10CC. Their album I Sheet Music is like a masterpiece of songwriting. And then Billy goes solo, and Phil Collins is the drummer on his solo album in like 1978 when like Genesis is still like the prog band that like your favorite band is listening to. Like Genesis is not genesis of the 80s just yet like it is crazy the amount of like connective tissue that this band has had with like all of these other bands in europe throughout their their fairly short career like a six-year run <laughs> like, mm -hmm. yeah really like four records but only three of them with the real band like then yeah. two of the guys left i think it's an interesting thing where i feel like bands start in sort of two ways either you start a band with your friends, people that you know that are around you, or you start a band where you just get ringers and you do like the session guys form this super group. And this is absolutely a, one of those yeah. session guys that just knew each other through the circuit and like, oh, we need a drummer. Okay, there's this, I know this ringer, you know, from over here. <laughs> this is definitely that band. And it worked. Yeah. And I think, but I also think that those bands have the shorter lifeline. I, totally. I think that there is something to be said about like, even the Beatles. I feel like I bring up the Beatles a lot because the Beatles is like arguably the greatest band in the world. They just released another single, which <laughs> is insane to say. And they've had like an insanely short career, right? They, they're they like 10 years total, I think, from start to finish and like however many albums they did in that time. But I wonder if that band would have even made it 10 years if Paul and John didn't grow up as like friends that went to school together and like decided to form a band together. Like if they were just like dudes who had different bands that crumbled and just said, fuck it, we'll write some music together. Like maybe we only got in like two or three because everything I've heard as a non, as the non-musician here, but from everything I've heard from any musician I've ever been friends with, 
spending three to four months in a van with a bunch of people, like it is a test of any relationship, be it your best friend or a total stranger. So you need those like positive memories to really keep you going that you might not have if it is, as you said, just a ringer. Like it's like as soon as you get annoyed with them, it's like, well, fuck you. I don't need this. (laughs) And you just leave. Totally. I think money is a big factor in those situations yeah. too, because yeah. when you're a session, if you're a top session person, you can probably make a lot more money just being in the studio or going on tour with somebody than going club to club. If you, you know, you make two or three records and you just never quite break through, you've got to follow the money if you can. It, Versus when you're, you know, like Chris and I, like when you're with your friends, that's all I know. Right. All I know is how to the, do that with those people. The ringer lifestyle is one that's foreign to me, but not foreign to everyone. I know, I know lots of people who, yeah, you you go do the thing because you're getting paid to do it because you're good enough. And I don't know what that's like. I only know, you know, putting my all into a band that you hope to break even, <laughs> you know, like how long yeah. that's been my life. You, you hope to make a few bucks or, or break even. But the the uh, the goal, the collective goal, the the drive, that's what keeps you going. I don't know. Separating yourself as being like this is just a paying gig. It feels feels pretty uninspired and yeah it probably would lead to things not lasting that long when it comes to pilot i gotta say they are as one hit wonder as it gets if you go i use apple music i know a lot of people use spotify but when you go on apple music and you look at pilot seven of the top eight songs that come up (laughs) are magic or versions of magic and you know in the uk January, the song January actually went to number one in the UK and it didn't even crack. It barely cracked the top 100 in the United States. Yeah, it was States. like it's 87 or something was yeah. where it peaked. It was not very strong. Spotify is not too far off from there. I think of the top five that it shows you, two or three were different versions of Magic. Obviously, January was up there as well. And then like one other random B-side. I'll tell you something that caught me off guard, though, with this band is I feel like I, in my brain, because I haven't listened to the song in forever. So when I was thinking of Pilot Magic, and maybe it is because of the commercial you were talking about, I was like, all right, this is like very soft. Like, I almost was thinking I was going to hear a bunch of music that sounded like Dreamweaver. You know what I mean? Like, just like very atmospheric, like piano driven, like, you know easy listening adult contemporary 70s rock music but i was like fairly shocked to hit play on some of these other songs and be like wow this has got like a queen influence to it it's got it's got like that very you can tell that these guitarists are good guitarists like it's these really unique guitar parts where it's not like a catchy riff it's like a very intricate <laughs> like guitar part that they're playing in tandem with each other um, guitarmony is the phrase I've heard people use, but there's a lot of guitarmony I hear in their songs. And like, it's like this rocks more than I thought it was going to rock when I thought yeah. about pilot magic. I was really shocked by that. You can see where they fit in with like 10 CC too. I mean, it's 100, that same, the, yeah. the arrangements are so tight and there's definitely some, they're showing off a little bit, but not so much as to step on each other. I mean, their arrangements are so tight and the fact that they can pack so much into their, you know, their songs are mostly three, four minute songs. But they feel proggy sometimes because there'll be so many parts, but they they figure out how to do that in a pop structure. It's fascinating. It's definitely 10 CC is a good comparison just because like they both have this element of like these bands where there's probably a little bit of Zappa influence, but not to the point that it's like unfocused. Like I, I like Frank Zappa, but I feel like a lot of the music is like fairly unfocused when you try to listen to it. And you have I to got find... a hot take on Frank Zappa. I think he's, you don't like him. I think he's terrible. <laughs> terrible. I tried. See, I tried. He's such an influence on so much, so much stuff that I love. And then, or, you know, I've heard these artists that I love say that he was an influence. And I go try to listen. I'm like, this is bad. This is not good. Yeah. I, unless I'm missing something. Unless I'm missing. I, I mean, if you listen to something like St. Alfonso's Pancake Breakfast, like it's <laughs> undeniable how much that song influences like someone like Les Claypool. At St. Alfonso's Pancake Breakfast. Where I stole the margarine. Where it's just like a two minute song that's so weird there's no fucking time signature anywhere to be found i love it's like, weird i love yeah weird. that's what i, I love, mean i love ween i love primus i love this stuff but frank zappa just doesn't do it for me but 
I, maybe I haven't we, heard the right stuff. We've said this before, though, Chris. Sometimes it doesn't help to be the first person to do something. Sure. <laughs> so, so I think that Definitely. Frank Zappa is a lot of the first person to do this stuff, and then you have people, bands like 10CC, or then in the 90s, bands like Ween and Primus, who like look at that and are able to boil it down to like same thing with like a band that. What's that? What, uh, what the is it? Trout face mask by Captain, Cap- Beef- Captain Beefheart. Yeah, where it's yeah. just like I've tried to listen to that album. It is a difficult album to listen to, but similar to Chris, every band that I love is like, oh, it's the greatest album that's ever been made. And he was Zappa adjacent. He played with Zappa. They were like, you know, he recorded a lot of those in Zappa Studio. So that was that's only a fraction of a step removed, as yeah. opposed to the other artists where you do get a little more focus down the line but pilot is not that <laughs> pilot is no, pilot is not pilot is perfect pop gems in a yeah in a time it's just a tiny prog pull like the tiniest yeah. of prog pulls hey welcome to unstable topics a fast-paced jam-packed unhinged bestie podcast filled with facts reacts and made-up games in between we're your hosts sarah and Maggie. And we're excited for you to join our best friend hangout, where we surprise one another with things we find interesting or hilarious just to see how the other will react. Our friendship might be totally stable, but you never know what your bestie might throw your way to knock you off your game. So come shake things up, learn something new, and laugh along with us. This is Unstable Topics. When I looked at what was popular at this time, You know, this song peaked in the United States at number five in January 12th of 1975. A lot of the top 10, I'm going to use this word, and I feel like the word, I don't know exactly what this word means, but I think it describes what was going on in music at the time. There's a lot of schmaltzy music. I was about (laughs) to say it is a schmaltzy top five that we're looking at here. (laughs) Some of these songs I didn't know. In, in the top 10, and I went and listened to him. Now, 10CC is in the top 10 at this yeah. moment with the song, I'm Not In Love. Now, I didn't know this song. I guess you guys know 10CC better than I do. Yeah. Well, uh, that's on the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack. Oh. It's probably the least popular song on the Guardians of the Galaxy but, Totally. But some of these <laughs> songs, I don't know if you guys know these songs. When we go back to the 70s, it's tough because there aren't a lot of songs I know. I don't know if you're a big 70s guy, Kai, uh, but I am actually. Okay. So I, I love that era. Okay. Like, all around. Even even the schmaltzy, cheesy, like air supply of it all. I, yeah. I love it. Okay. So do you know this strap song? In. <laughs> do you know this song? So Magic was at number five. Do you know this song, Wildfire by Michael Murphy, that was popular at the time? I don't. Okay. But I'm I will absolutely check it out. I hope this is a one-hit wonder cuz I would love to do an episode about this. This song Wildfire, very easy listening 70s type song, you know? But I had to mark down some of the lyrics in this. It's called Wildfire and these are some of the lyrics. On a pony she named Wildfire with a whirlwind by her side on a cold Nebraska night. Oh, they say she died one winter when there came a killing frost and the pony she named Wildfire busted down its stall in a blizzard he was lost. She ran calling Wildfire is the is the chorus of this song. And I just I was like, wow, what is what is this song? And how have I never heard this song about a pony before? Thought it was interesting. That sounds like some some American Plains poetry. You just <laughs> yeah. picture like someone in a covered yeah. wagon at night by a fire. I'm googling right now just to see if he's a one hit wonder. And the I thing so. it starts off with was it says Michael Martin Murphy is an American songwriter and the founding member of the Progressive Country Movement. <laughs> okay, so, uh, <laughs> there you go. At this time, listen to what the man said from Wings. Uh, I had to go listen to this one too. It's I like it. But it's yeah. such like what people would complain about uh, as far as schmaltzy sure. Paul McCartney wings songs. Like I, it's very adult, contemporary, jazzy, upbeat, like using everything in the book, every production trick of that era in the song. I still like it. Uh, number two at this time is The Hustle from Van McCoy and the Soul City Symphony. And number <laughs> one at this time, was love will keep us together from the captain and Tennille, as schmaltzy as it gets, I would yep. say. That's perfect. So, uh, so it looks like Michael Michael Murphy had 
quite a few top 10 and top okay. 20 hits. Well, so he will not be someone we cover. So we can deep dive into Wildfire all well, you want today. <laughs> well, Magic, my point about this is Magic kind of rocks compared to some of the songs that were yeah. on the charts. Yeah. As far as songs that were a little further down on the charts, but songs we all know, Jive Talking from the Bee Gees was number 22 at this time. Nice. Someone Saved My Life Tonight from Elton John is number 25. Pretty schmaltzy. Uh, sweet Emotion from Aerosmith cracked Ooh. the top 40 at this time. How Sweet It Is to Be Loved by You from James Taylor at number 43. A song I love at number 54 is Send in the Clowns from Judy Collins. Oh, it's great. beautiful. It's one of the yeah. saddest songs from a musical ever written. Uh, that song is so, so sad. Yeah. But as far as <laughs> rocking stuff, at number 59 was Feel Like Making Love from Bad Company. And at number 60 at this point was Ballroom Blitz from Sweet. So there was some more rocking stuff. It was a little further down. Uh, but Magic, as far as the top 10, was definitely the most rocking thing, even though it's pretty much just straight pop at this time. And they really blend all of that. I mean, they do have a definite adult contemporary Mm seventies singer songwriter vibe and a lot of them vocal melodies, I think, but then the music is guitar and piano forward, but the piano is very rock piano, you know, very, you know, quarter notes really going for it, but that they really blend what was happening. Then you think about like disco and adult contemporary and then serious guitar rock was all, that's yeah. really what was existing in American music. It's that's probably why Pilot got as far as they did here with that. It was perfect timing. I probably, if I was growing up, if I was thirteen years old in this era, Pilot probably looking at these charts would be what I was listening to. I think. Yeah. The only other thing that I have in my notes that we have to bring up though is what this song is about. Okay. It's. It's perfectly 70s also, I think, right? Yes. Just- so so according to Pat- Patton, the song is inspired by watching a sunrise. David Payton. <laughs> da- Payton, <laughs> What'd you call him? Dad Patton? Patton. No, I said according to <laughs> according to Patton. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the song is inspired by the sunrise on Blackford Hill in Edinburgh. And then in 2012, he later expressed that it was inspired by his wife who had never seen a daybreak before. And that inspired the writing of the song. Wow. That's that's really nice. <laughs> and then I read the lyrics. I'm like, yep, this is literally a song about watching the sunrise. Never been awake. Never seen a daybreak. Leaning on my pillow in the morning. Lazy day in bed. Music in my head. Crazy music playing in the morning light. It's magic, you know. <laughs> Wait a minute. Back up. This woman was old enough to be married and had never seen the sun come up before? <laughs> <laughs> that... <laughs> She does live in in Scotland. You have to keep it. Yeah, mind. okay, that is fair. Like, okay, all right. Uh, I love my sunny day. Dream of far away. Dreaming on my pillow in the morning. Never been awake. Never seen the daybreak. Leaning on my pillow in the morning light. I didn't know if this was like a room type situation or something. No one, <laughs> that. It's a bad joke. I'm sorry. Uh, did, did you guys watch any? live videos or at least the fake live videos from like the top pop thing and whatever did you see yeah, any of them these guys are I did. appropriately ridiculous looking and i love it I, <laughs> in the i yes. watched one of those top of the pop style it was one of it was i don't know which european country it was from the guy's playing a double neck guitar in it love yep. that i watched one where while they're performing I don't know if it was magic or maybe it may have been a January performance, but there were bubbles the whole time, which I loved. <laughs> uh, I think that that's a great that's idea. That's probably magic. Yes. Uh, yeah, that would make Feels sense like good, that there would be that dressing for magic. bubbles during magic. Uh, I like it. I like the way they look, uh, and I, I think they're pretty cool. I watched an interview with, the, uh, with Peyton from, it was like 10 years ago, and it was some, I don't know if it was the BBC or something like that, but He's a delightful guy. He is smiling yeah. the whole time. He is enjoying talking about the song. Uh, I saw that <laughs> as a lot of artists do these days, maybe even some of our friends do, uh, there is a Christmas version of this. Of course, yes. it's, oh, 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 it's Christmas <laughs> with some jingle bells <laughs> added. There is a sped up version of this, of course, uh, and you know, kind of playing the game. And I don't know if I can blame david payton for for uh trying to capitalize a little bit on the resurgence of this song 
Yeah, I no, also you... saw they went back like 10 years ago and did the thing that you know, a lot of artists are doing where they took their five biggest songs and they re-recorded them so they could own the masters. Yeah, I like and that. Just, and so, you know, now anywhere you hear magic, hopefully next time there's a placement that's not the Ozempic placement, it's their version. So he, you know, <laughs> yeah. they get all the money. Yeah, that's cool. And he wrote this song too, to be fair. I guess he was the primary songwriter on it. So yeah. he yeah. was probably the one that licensed everything. It's definitely interesting to look at the pilot Wikipedia page because... It has current members and past members, and current members is just David. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, that's how it goes sometimes. He's just yeah. he's just keeping the name alive. Doing, I'm sure he grabs some touring musicians. We were talking about hired guns. Like, yeah, why probably not? just hits the road with some hired guns, sings his heart out, and then yeah, yeah, Pro- probably part, that, of, part of a '70s money. a '70s package. Uh, my question now to you guys, are you guys ready to play a game? Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the saw? Uh, saw? Yes, saw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Your no, room is a trap. This is, yeah. a, this is a much safer game than saw. But basically, I'm going to read a question. If one of you guys knows the answer, you buzz in by saying Ozempic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, <laughs> because this game is all about songs that were used or parodied in commercials. Are you ready? Okay. Ready. Here we go. Zillow used a song by this indie darling to pack emotion into a commercial that shows what it's like to pick your first home. Do you have multiple choice for these? No. If you don't know it, you don't know it. I don't know it. Yeah, I think I'm also on a don't know it. Okay, it was Bright Eyes, First Day of My Life, was used in a Oh my God, that's right. Wow. I, I saw that commercial recently and thought, Bright Eyes, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no score. This bearded rocker's voice was synonymous with Chevy trucks from 1991 until 2014. Uh, Ozempic. Ozempic. <laughs> oh man, I was close. I'm going to give it to our guest, Matt. <laughs> okay, fair. Bob Seger. You got yeah. it. Like, like a rock. A rock. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Kai, you got it. That was a close one, though. Okay. Next question. Some weird hamsters danced around a Kia Soul to this hip-hop duo in a Super Bowl ad. Oh, fuck. Oh, God damn it. Ozempic. Okay. Was it tag team? No, it was not. Ozempic. <sighs> okay, Matt. Was it... Um, oh my god, I can't remember the other guy's name. Was it Rob Bass? Was it It Takes Two? No, you're both ah, wrong. Fuck. It was actually Black Sheep. The choice is yours. Oh, choice is yours. <sighs> All right. God, that's one of the best rap songs of. <laughs> that's a great song. <laughs> oh god, damn it! That record's really good. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good song. All right, Kai's still up one nothing. This Canadian indie pop singer songwriter helped sell the iPod Nano. With her insanely catchy numerical song. Numerical song. Who was selling the iPod Nano? I will note it was the first place and probably the only place I heard this song. I don't know. Kai? Kai doesn't wait, know. Wait, numeric. Numer- oh, wait, hold on a second. You said numeric, right? I did. I'm going to go Ozempic on this. Okay. Was it Feist? Was it one, two, three, four by Feist? You got it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> nice job. All right. We got a tie game. Okay, we got three questions left. Okay. The Swiffer Wet Jet did a parody of this new wave classic to help sell its mops. Ozempic. Yeah. Was it Devo's Whip It? You got it. Ah, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> you must Swiffer. That's yeah, what it was. Oh, that is weak. At least Cool Whip. <laughs> when they used it, made way more sense. All right. All right. Kai got a two to one lead. The use of this band's song in a 2007 Wendy's commercial for a new fish sandwich caused a rift in the band that caused them to break up. Oh, fuck. Um, Ozempic. Go ahead. Blister in the Sun by the Violent Femmes. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good job, man. They got back together in 2013, but yeah. it did cause them to break up for a while. Okay. It comes down to the final question. Um, here we go. In quite possibly the most heinous and ridiculous commercial song parody ever created, Mountain Dew did an all-out Mountain Dew-themed version of what classic song in the year 2000? I honestly have no clue. Can you give us any hint here? 
because this is a tie-breaking question. <laughs> this is a song from the 70s that also had a resurgence in the 90s. Song from the 70s had a resurgence in the 90s. Mountain Dew did a whole Mountain Dew century. A whole Mountain Dew parody of it in the year 2000. Can you give us an artist? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we're going to have to uh, call it a tie today. I don't know. What because was it? Oh, I'm going to request that Matt puts a sample of this in the because you can find it on YouTube. It was a Mountain Dew version of Bohemian Rhapsody. I see a little silhouette of a can. Mountain Dew, Mountain Dew, time to do the slam dango. Citrus taste and quenching, very, very exciting. Me. Fantastico, 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 Fantastico. Just thirsty dudes, anybody knows that. They're just thirsty dudes out on a thirsty day, sparing their life from this banality. Easy come, easy go, will he get the do? Bismillah. No, he will not get the do. Get the do. Bismillah. She will not get the do. Get the do. Bismillah. They will not get the do. Get the do. We will get the do. Get the do. We will get the do. Here we go. What? Yes, that exists. Oh, no. So that's my game. Sorry it ended in a tie, guys, but that's Well, okay. you know what? I, okay. You've made, because there was one that, that I said out loud and then realized that there was a chance that it came up again. Um, just out of curiosity, before we wrap up the show, is there any other uh, songs that you pretty much exclusively associate with the product that it was selling? Because I def remember, definitely remember as a kid in the early 90s that I, for many years, only associated the song Cool Jerk with selling Cool Whip because it was used in those Cool Whip commercials. <laughs> what song is that? What's Cool Jerk? Cool Jerk. Dun, 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 dun. Cool Jerk. Dun. It's okay. literally a song from the 60s about a dance and they just changed Jerk to Whip. <laughs> okay, I don't remember that one. <laughs> Kai, do you have anything that you need to promote before we dive into this? I mean, nothing really. I've, I have made a kid's record that came out about a year ago called uh, the product's called Good Kids, so... Check it out if you have kids. It's fun. But Hell really yeah. nothing, no. Yeah. That's Around. a good thing to promote. Did yeah. I, it did came I out see, almost a year ago. Did I see recently that, that that album got a little bit of recognition? It was on the Grammy ballot. So that's awesome. We that's the first step to being then getting a Grammy nomination. There's basically a, it's a two step process. So we don't know yet if we got the nomination. I'm certain we didn't, but just to be that far was, was pretty sweet. I, 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 I've never gotten that far. That's amazing, man. Yeah. That's really that's cool. Two, yeah. That makes us two guests that we've had on this show who have gotten onto the Grammy ballad for children's album <laughs> that have been on this that's, podcast. <laughs> Why? Who else did? Mega Ran. Oh, <laughs> nice. Like, that's awesome. That's <laughs> so, so cool. So awesome, yeah, man. that's 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 dope as hell that we have uh we are the spot for children album <laughs> Grammy ballad artists. <laughs> artists. Yeah, love that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sorry. Now, Thunder Blunder time. Okay. Kai, we'll start with you. Pilot. Were they I'm did they bring the one hit thunder or were they one hit blunder? I think they're one hit thunder personally. Okay. I think beyond having success with other songs elsewhere, I I just think those first three records are so, so underappreciated. Matt, how do you feel about it? I'm going to go Thunder on this. I, even without the confusion of the Alan Parsons Project Serious song, like I was enjoying every single song that came on. And, you know, I've always said that part of the point of this show is like, did did the United States make a misfire? Like, should we have allowed this band to be bigger than we actually allowed them to? And in the case of Pilot, I think, yeah. Like, like they they didn't have songs that I thought, well, this is awful. There's a reason why Magic is the only song that matters. Like, it's the catchiest song, but it's not like they didn't have great songs outside of it. So, you know, if you're listening to the episode, go check out Pilot. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I came in... When I first knew we were doing this episode, I was coming in thinking like, because of the Ozempic thing alone, I was like, <laughs> this is going to be a blunder. Then I dove in and a couple things. One, when I watched the interview with David Payton, I was like, oh, this guy's awesome. This guy's a delight. He loves talking about this song. He's, you know, just seems like a really cool guy. Now that shouldn't affect the Thunder Blunder thing, but I like that. Then... 
When I took a look at what was popular in the charts at that time, and considering the Captain and Tennille was number one at this time, I'm like, well, this is definitely way cooler than most of the stuff that was on the charts at that time. And then when I listened to some more songs, especially January, I like January. I might like January more than I like magic. Uh, and I was like, this band's really good. And I like that guys from this band were associated with Kate Bush, that they were associated with those, man, Alan Parsons project that, which by the way, Alan Parsons produced this album. The I don't song, know if you man. mentioned that. Yes. This song. I love that eye in the sky song too. That song's awesome. <laughs> um, just in general, I, I I can't deny David Payton or Pilot. Uh, this is this is thunder, which makes this certified thunder. All right, David it's Payton, a- look for uh, look for the certification in the mail. Uh, yes. We'll get that to you. Uh, we'll have a pilot fly it over <laughs> to Just you get in it the UK. <laughs> <laughs> This has been One Hit Thunder. One Hit Thunder is hosted by Chris Fafalios of the band Punchline and produced by Matt Kelly of Geekscape.net. Underneath me, you're hearing the Punchline cover of Christmas Baby Please Come Home off their new album, Holiday Hits, which is available on tdrrecords.com. Also check out punchline.com for any upcoming news of the band. Our podcast is on Patreon now. Find us at patreon.com backslash O-H-T podcast for early access to episodes, bonus conversations, and a chance to vote on future songs for us to cover. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to us on any podcasting app, and tune in next week for more One Hit Thunder. Hey, this is Mike Wiebe, and I'm the singer in a band called The Riverboat Gamblers. And I'm Zach Blair. I play guitar in a band called Rise Against. Mike and I also have a band called The Draculas, and we also have this great, amazing new podcast called Zach and Mike Make Three. Yeah, each week we're going to ask ourselves and we're going to ask our guests what three favorite things they are into at that moment or in their entire lives. And then we're either going to agree with them or we're going to make fun of them. And uh, you're going to listen to it and you're going to like it or we will make fun of you. How about that? I just flipped it on you, the person listening to this right now. But we're going to do it every week here on the Sound Talent Network. Once again, it's called Zach and Mike Make Three. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, we're out there, everyone. I'm Hal Schwartz. And I'm Flynn McClain. Together, we host None But the Brave, a podcast dedicated to the music and career of Bruce Springsteen. Bruce and E Street Band are on tour right now for the first time in six years, and we're taking a detailed look at what's happening on stage in our bi weekly episodes. We've also been recently joined by some very exciting guests, including rock journalist Warren Zanes and Stephen Hyden, Backstreet's Magazine founder Charles Cross, and Barstool's Kirk Menahan. If you're a diehard Springsteen fan, this is the show for you. So please subscribe to Nimbut the Brave on your favorite podcasting platform, and we hope to see you further on up the road. Thank you so much! We'll be seeing you!